Welcome back to Clean Cut, where we can talk about the truth about just about anything, as long as we use logic and common sense. This season, we're discussing the heresies that have surfaced throughout the history of the Church, and today, we'll talk about Protestantism. It's often supposed that Martin Luther is the one most responsible for Protestantism, and indeed, it wouldn't have taken the form it did without him, but it wasn't any of Luther's doctrinal or theological errors that gave birth to Protestantism as we know it today. Indeed, very few Protestants of today would agree with Luther's views. Between the time of the Cathars and the birth of Martin Luther, hundreds of years went by, and in that time, he wasn't the only one to make major theological mistakes, or even to stubbornly insist on them, despite their condemnation as false by the authority of the Catholic Church. Jan Hus, for instance, held many of the same views as Martin Luther, and held them quite a bit earlier. However, he wasn't a Protestant. So, what makes a person a Protestant? Martin Luther was born on November 10th, 1483, and over time, he became a vicar, overseeing 11 monasteries. He started to take issue with certain doctrines of the Catholic Church, such as the authority of those in the Church to forgive sins, and the whole practice of indulgences. He questioned the validity of the Sacrament of Confession in his 95 Thesis, and went looking for people to debate him on these topics. However, no one seemed to want to do that. Many of those in the church expected Luther to end up like previous dissenters from the faith, such as Huss, and not cause significant harm. If he'd lived half a century earlier, that might have been the case. However, Martin Luther had access to a piece of technology that John Huss hadn't possessed, the printing press. With this astonishing device, he was able to completely avoid having to justify his views at all, merely by printing a few hundred copies of his heretical teachings and spreading them among the public, who in most cases didn't have the theological training needed to see the errors in them. This same technique is still used to exploit ignorance and lead people into error today, in newspapers and on the internet. Those who can't defend their views with logic often resort to just circulating them more widely and getting a lot of people on their side that way. After first posting his theses in 1517, Luther began to set up his own faith community on April 18, 1520 AD. Worse yet, far from merely printing errors in doctrine, Martin Luther taught that anyone could know the truth about what to believe simply by studying the Bible on their own then proceeded to cut out entire books of the Bible which contradicted or didn't support his views. He cut out from his German translation of the Bible the books that we now call Tobit, Judith, Wisdom, Sirach, Baruch, First and Second Maccabees, and parts of Daniel and Esther. And he would have cut out more if some of his followers hadn't persuaded him not to. He didn't like the Epistle of St. James or the Book of Revelation, and he also defaced the text of Romans 3.28 by adding the word alone to it. When asked to justify himself, his reply was, because Dr. Luther would have it so. He also lived in a time when the secular governments wanted greater power for themselves and chafed under the greater authority of the Catholic Church. So in their view, by supporting him, they'd be weakening the hold of the church over their territories and, at least in theory, strengthening their own hold. Of course, this didn't work out for them. As it turned out, religious revolution was a good deal more bloody and chaotic than human lords or rulers were prepared to deal with, and many, many Catholics were killed, their property seized by the Protestants who followed Luther's example, writing propaganda designed to incriminate the Catholic Church as they went. Of course, by that point, the genie was out of the bottle and there was no getting it back in. The seed of make up your own religion had been planted in people's minds, and the temptation was strong enough that it decimated the unity that Christendom had once enjoyed. Even Luther himself soon found that the consequences of his actions had gone far beyond his ability to control them, during a heated argument that he had with fellow Protestant Ulrich Zwingli. Luther became increasingly furious and desperate as he tried in vain to sway Zwingli back into the position that the Eucharist was really Christ, a position that the scriptures overtly supported. And yet, without the authority of the Catholic Church to back him up, there was no way for him to definitively prove that Zwingli's interpretation of the Bible was wrong. To determine when one interpretation is correct and another is incorrect, you need a deciding authority, and Martin Luther had rejected that. Luther was eventually sent a papal edict telling him to recant his writings, but he publicly set the edict on fire and was excommunicated by Pope Leo X on January 3, 1521. So, 
What is Protestantism? What are Protestants protesting? Catholic Church teachings? No. Many people have protested the teachings of the Church without being Protestants, and many Protestants actually protest teachings that the Catholic Church doesn't even hold and never did, as a result of misunderstanding or misinterpreting Church doctrines and practices. Some might say that it's a protest against the authority of the Church of publicly excommunicating Luther, and indeed, most Protestants would fall into that category. That seems to be a good working definition of the term Protestant as it's now used. But curiously enough, even that isn't what the word originally meant. So, what did it originally mean? Well, remember how I mentioned those secular leaders who are trying to use Lutheranism as a crowbar to get the authority of the Catholic Church out of their land? Well, Lutheranism started in Germany, and in 1529, there was something called the Diet of Spires. Now, I know what you're thinking, but no, this diet wasn't some grossly ineffective attempt to lose weight, like the diets that we're familiar with. It came from the Latin word dieta, and it was a word for a council or gathering of leaders in the Holy Roman Empire, where there would be deliberation and legislation, kind of like what happens at the UN. Well, in any case, the interesting thing about this diet was the decree it released to the states of the empire. Basically, the decree of the Diet of Spires was that religious liberty should be granted to those who'd already embraced Lutheranism, but it also insisted that Catholics should be permitted to live in those same territories. It was a statement of religious liberty and tolerance, with which I suspect most Americans would at least sympathize. However, at that same time, a bunch of German princes got together and said, No, we protest this decree. Whoever is the ruler, his must be the religion. In short, the German princes demanded that they have the right to impose their own religion on their subjects and not be forced to tolerate the presence of Catholics on their land. They were the first group of people that the word Protestant was used to describe, and that is where the term originally came from. It came from people who were steadfastly opposed to religious liberty and tolerance. Protestantism fragmented Christianity, where once the number of Christian religions could be counted on one hand, there were suddenly thousands of denominations in a very short period of time, almost all of which are composed of Protestants who, without some central authority, are still in irreconcilable disagreement with one another. Our next jump forward will be quite a bit shorter than the last couple, as we pay a visit to Bishop Jansenius of Ypres, France in the 17th century. That's all for now, so keep asking questions, and thanks for watching.